Well, as the coverage of the election in Indo State continues, all 14 contenders are leaving no stone unturned and taking no chance. To them, all that matters is a level playing field and a free and fair election process, even as the vote counting continues. Dele Momodu, a seasoned journalist, publisher, and chairman of Ovation Media Group, joins us now. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, good morning, Adefemi and Oji. How are you today? Morning. We're doing very okay, well, thank, thank you. you. Um, now, what would you attribute Great. the sort of uh, peaceful process that we witnessed at yesterday's election? You know, many have credited it to the Edo people wanting a free and fair election. And some also have credited it to the uh, Oba Benin's intervention. Well, I would like to thank the good people of Edo State uh, for the way we conducted ourselves in Edo yesterday. Though I was not on ground, I'm in Lagos. Uh, we were all apprehensive that it was going to be a bloodbath. And you can't blame those who expected doomsday in Edo yesterday. The stakes were quite very high. Uh, we have to know that an incumbent governor uh, failed to clinch the ticket of his original party, APC, and so he was forced to go to PDP. Also, the former governor of the state, two-term governor, uh, Adam Sosio Mole, who was also the national chairman of the APC, uh, was heavily involved. In fact, it looks more like a contest between Obaseki and uh, Adams, Aliyu, Oshio Mole. So everybody uh, was very worried that there might be so much desperation and that uh, there will be breakdown of law and order. And don't forget that also the Nigerian police actually sent a detachment of about 30-something thousand officers uh, which a lot of people screamed about that, hey, we hope they are not being sent to harass the people of Edo State. But so far, so good. I think the skirmishes were very, very minimal, and we're happy that so far everything seems to be going well. Uh, so if the results look transparent enough, so whoever is the winner, I'm sure it will be easier for people to accept Mr. Momodu, forgive me, forgive me, but I was quite shocked when I read your introduction uh, where we described you as uh, an Edo State indigent. I didn't know that. So if you could <laughs> confirm that for me, for my, for my own personal record, before we go ahead with our next question. Is that true? Is that yes. so? Yes. Yeah, it's very true. A lot of people don't know that I'm from Edo State because my father had migrated from Onwan East, what is Onwan East, local government today, to the ancient city of Ileife, where I was born, where I grew up, where I had all my education from primary uh, to first degree to second degree. So, and the first degree in Yoruba, so a lot of people, and then my name is Dele, so a lot of people believe uh, I am uh, a full Yoruba by uh, blood, but no, my father had migrated uh, from what we call a do state today to Ilefe, where he met my mom, a Yoruba woman from Bogon, and I was born and bred in Ilefe. So, uh, but uh -huh. ordinarily, I'm qualified to also claim Osho State. Uh, I should be able to contest in, in Osho State, uh, but I'm proud of my father's origin. I went home after he died. Uh, everybody was afraid because in those days there was the superstition that I would be killed by witches and wizards if I go home. And, but I insisted, I wanted to see my people. My mom was worried, but I went and I came back and I'm alive. <laughs> 
Um, we're happy to hear that. Thank you for that uh, clearing up. It's good to know that Nigeria, I mean, Thank it's you. no secret that Nigeria is multicultural, but it is good to hear about different stories when it comes to Nigeria's multiculturalism. So thank you for that. As we segue back to the election itself now, thank you. if we were to get your, your, your feedback, in your assessment, what has been the conduct of the electoral body, the INEC, INEC itself in this election? Have you been uh, surprised by their conduct? Have you been disappointed or are you happy with what's been happening with INEC so far? I, I, I would say kudos to them so far, uh, but uh, we are hoping that at the end we justify the means. Uh, so it is uh, a morning yet on creation day, if I could borrow that adage from a writer. You know, uh, so far so good, they are doing well. But I am disturbed and worried, like everyone else, about the failure of technology. Uh, with the amount of money we spend on INET, year in, year out, there should be no excuse whatsoever about failure of technology. Because the old world, these days, you can cast your vote from anywhere. Technology has advanced beyond saying uh, the card reader is not working, this is not working, that is not working. By now, every agent already has a copy of the results. By now, I am sure that both the leading parties, they had their situation rooms, and they should be in possession of the entire results. Uh, how many people voted in Edo State that were going to wait for days before the conclusion of the election. It's, it, for me, it's unfortunate that we are still very backward in the way we conduct elections in Nigeria. It shouldn't be that bad at all. Uh, so I think the, the government of the day needs to do something. I thought under Atahiru Jega, Professor Atahiru Jega, we had advanced to a level that we never expected would you know, fall below. But it seems... Uh, reverse is the case, and uh, we're only hoping that Edo elections will show some level of preparation, seriousness uh, on the path of INEC. Right. Um, you know, let's just uh, go back to your history. You are one that has, you know, contested for presidency. I still describe you as a politician, right? You know, how would you describe the position of the presidency in this electionary process? Um, you know, more recently, the, uh, you, you have also condemned this present administration of a weak foreign policy. Well, we'll look at, you know, the recent ban on uh, electoral offenders by the UK government and the US government, which the presidency has um, actually described as disrespectful to Nigeria's uh, sovereignty. I'd love your comment on that. And do you think that this is one, one uh, of the reasons why the electoral process, especially in this Edo election, has been quite um, successful, I would say? Well, let me start by saying I am a part-time politician. <laughs> I cannot make politics my vocation. Yeah. <laughs> Nigeria is the only country I know where people are ready to uh, be perpetual uh, politicians. Perpetual, I call them serial contestants. You contest to be president today, tomorrow is governorship, day after is senatorial. I won't do that. So I'm part-time. Every one of us were a political animal. So that's how I see it. Yes, I agree with you that it seems that we must say a big thank you to the United States of America and the, uh, the British government for sending a powerful message to our government that we will no longer condone the rascality of just putting anybody in power without proper elections. I can see that it worked, my, it worked magic. Anyone who knows Nigerian leaders very well, we don't joke with the ability to travel and gallivant all over the world. So once your children are threatened, uh, you, the leaders are threatened that you will not be able to travel, your visas will be revoked, and you will not be granted visas to travel, then you become personal non grata. So they don't like that. Uh, even the protests from the Nigerian government was very mild-mannered. 
Uh, they were not called William Willers. They were not called the kind of unprintable names we were called back home. So I pray that uh, other uh, friends of Nigeria will continue to put pressure on our government so that we can get serious. Is it Nigerians are amongst the greatest people on earth. And the only problem we have is always about leadership. Mm. And how do you get your leaders? Your leaders without proper elections. So we are hoping that the Edo election will be a good and veritable example that we are ready for serious business with the Committee of Nations. In the, on, the, on the topic, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with the question because you didn't answer my question regarding the federal government, you know, describing this ban as being disrespectful to Nigeria's sovereignty. Is it, is it disrespectful, would you say? It is not disrespectful. Uh, the world is a global village uh, and we also intervene in other people's uh, lives and elections. If you look at it, even our president traveled to Mali the other day, you know, to try and persuade the, the, the various actors, political actors, you know, to be reasonable and all that. So if we can intervene in the affairs of Mali, I was there in the Gambia when our government and other ECOWAS presidents were negotiating with the former president, Yaya Jame, uh, to leave power for the winner of their election. And nobody in the Gambia accused us of uh, uh, trying to meddle in, in their affairs. So the, the world has gone beyond where we can ignore what happens in other places. And don't forget that we are the ones who invite investors to come to our country. So you cannot ask a man not to protect his investment because if there is instability in Nigeria, then uh, the investments will be endangered. So that is why they talk. They are not talking because they hate Buhari. Uh, and don't forget that even for President Buhari to become president in 2015, the then president, the Barack Obama, had to send the Secretary of State to Nigeria to come and meet with the principal actors, you know, in that election, and that helped prepare, prepare a fertile ground uh, for our president. So there is no way we can complain about what we've benefited from in the past. Indeed. Well, thank you very much. Deli Mobudu will stay with us uh, for some time, but it is time for us to cross live back to Benin City, where the collation has resumed in uh, Edo State. We know that they took a break an hour long and they have continued collating. So we're going to cross live to Benin City. We're hoping to speak to one of our correspondents or at the very least have a look at the collation process happening there. Let's take a listen. Well, as we continue looking at the pictures of the collation of results con as they continue to be underway, we'll still uh, continue on our discussion with Dele Momodu there. Dele, in the run-up to this election, definitely you heard slogans from each political party. But one slogan that we've heard a lot in the coming days, and especially yesterday, into today, was that Edo Nobi Lagos. Forgive my, my pigeon if it's not the greatest. If you were to hear that slogan, which is effectively saying that Edo is not Lagos, that is obviously literally true, but it also has wider connotations in terms of the fact that you had certain political figures uh, speaking to uh, the people of Edo State, imploring them not to vote for a certain person. What, 
how, what type of, uh, how important rather do you think that slogan, Edonobi Lagos, is to the election and the results so far? Well, we have to wait until all the elections have been fully declared. Then I will know if the slogan, I don't know if Lagos has worked magic. Uh, but so far, it seems it's working. Uh, it, it was a very strategic slogan for the people of Edo State to say that nobody from outside Edo State can dictate to us who should be our governor. Uh, but they should know that uh, APC... Uh, definitely is interested, and uh, they were referring uh, to the national leader of APC, Ashwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu, that he shouldn't come to Edo State and dictate to them who should be their governor. Uh, but he has everything at stake there. Uh, the former national chairman of the party was very loyal to him. They are very good friends, and uh, all he's trying to do is to show him some loyalty. Uh, it's payback time, so he has to stand by Adam to show money, but I'm not sure if that has gone down well with the people of Edo State who believe that it should be uh, a straight contest between Zay Yamu and Godwin Obaseki. So that is what that slogan is all about. But we won't know if truly uh, both Tinu Abu and Adam Sushio Mole have been fitted uh, as interested parties in the election of Edo State. Yeah, I, I wouldn't ask you now what your predictions are, because I feel like I, would, I already know the answer, being a, an Edo State indigent. But what would you say the significance of Obaseki winning this election will be for Nigeria in general? Well, it's a very delicate one for me. You are putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, but what I can say is I am not there in Edo State right now. I am also very anxious to know the results. But so far, so good. It seems that Obaseki has performed beyond expectation, especially in the areas already declared. But we don't know if Ize Yamu also has his own joker coming from the other zones that we are awaiting. And the experience of the past have shown that we have to be cautiously optimistic because there is what Fela called government magic. Uh, so there is a proverb, a very popular African proverb, that a woman whose child has been killed by a witch begins to suspect every woman of being a witch. So in Nigeria, our minds are never at rest until the final uh, whistle from INEC to say, yes, we have conducted the election and the election is over and here is the winner. Mm -hmm. So we are watching. Uh, but it looks to me like Obaseki is doing extremely well. It looks like that. But then I will still recommend cautious optimism. Understood. We do, we do hear what you're saying in terms of it being still a little too early to tell and that we should wait for that final whistle. But so often in Nigerian politics, whether it's at the, the federal level or at the state level, the final whistle isn't always the final whistle. So do you think that, especially with both candidates signing a peace accord, that one, once the, the winner is declared, that there will be a graceful concession from one politician, one leader, one party to the other, or do you think this will end up in court, whoever is announced the winner? If the pattern we see right now persists and endures and Obaseki wins, I think there will be less rancor. But if the people of Edo State suspect that government magic has come into play, then I believe uh, things might change suddenly and dramatically. Uh, but if the pattern we see right now, I'm not talking as a media practitioner, I'm someone who understands public relations. The mood in Endo State right now favors obesity. I'm being objective. This is not my personal opinion. 
talking to different people on Grand Edo State, it seems the mood is that the people of Edo State are not happy about interventions, especially from the former governor and national chairman of APC. A lot of people don't like. I know so many people who don't like Obaseke at all. I can tell you that for free. But because of the involvement of Adams Oshio Mole, and don't forget that Adams had overpraised Obaseke in the past. So these videos went viral. They were showing it at public places, at roundabouts, on giant billboards. It was like Adam Sushomole was still campaigning for Basiki. So it's very difficult to turn all that around within a few months and say, no, a man you called names. I don't want to even call, mention those names that, you know, Ize Yamu was called by Adam Sushomole. He went all out to obliterate Ize Yamu in the past. And now to change someone you call the Lucifer suddenly to a pope, I think in public relations, that is always difficult. Maybe if they had picked a different candidate who didn't have that kind of baggage, then all the enemies of Obaseki who believe that he wasn't playing, he, 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 he didn't manage people well. The, the excuse everywhere is that all his friends who helped him, he abandoned them when he became governor. You know, but now it's like a catch-22 situation. So they had to choose between two devils, as they put it, and they felt that, look, in Obaseki's case, we are facing only one man. In the case of Ize Yamu, we are facing minimum three formidable people. So Obaseki then became the underdog. And you know, someone had mentioned it earlier on your program that people love the weak man. People love to support the weak man. And Obaseki was able to play that game very well. That look, the, way, the reason they don't like me is because I'm not sharing money with them. The reason they don't like and you know, that resonates easily with voters everywhere in the world. Uh, so, but like I said, with, with this government, anything can still happen. We've seen elections that we thought, okay, this was a clear victory for a particular candidate, and within a twinkle of an eye, everything changed. Mm -hmm. So let's hope that Edo State uh, will be well managed, and trust me, if this thing ends well, like Shakespeare will say, all is well that ends well, I will give a standing ovation to INEC and to the federal government and all those involved. Okay, so what you're saying is that it's because of the way uh, the Godfather's posture, Adam Soshomali and, uh, you know, the Godfather in Lagos, is one of the major reasons why the process is in favor of Obaseki. And not really because the people of Edo State want to, um, you know, eradicate this issue of Godfatherism in our nation. You see... There are godfathers everywhere in the world, even in the United States. Obama had, you know, the Kennedy family supporting him. He had the Oprah Winfrey's. So you will always have support from certain powerful individuals in society. But in this case, Adams Ushio Mole took this matter too personal. It was as if, if I... Till now, some of us are asking, what was the matter between them? They used to be the best of friends. I was with uh, Comrade Adam Sushomale at a hotel last year. We spent almost one hour together where I was appealing to him that, oh God, you are my big egg Leave this man alone. Even if he has offended you, leave him to God. So, but... He will tell you, oh, I'm not fighting. Anytime you speak to either of the two, they will tell you, oh, I'm not fighting. I saw the governor at the 60th birthday of the This Day publisher, and he stopped. We spoke about it. I said, I've spoken to your uh, comrade, and this one comrade, the, the governor to say, oh, no, I'm not fighting. So it was difficult for all their friends who tried to reconcile them to achieve anything tangible. It was they were all bent on mutual destruction. Because if Comrade had left the governor alone, 
by now it is possible that we'll still be national chairman. If Obaseki wins this election, then it is like they have castrated comrade Adam Sushiomole politically. And that would be unfortunate. So they had so much at stake. Both of them right now have so much at stake and neither of them will give up until the final results come out. Everybody is still trying to make sure that they have the upper hand. It, it, it's, it's such a tragedy because we should be talking about policies, we should be talking about development, but here we are, we're talking about personalities. Exactly. Exactly. It's we're shame. talking about personalities so and not it the people. So it wasn't that we didn't talk to them, it, it wasn't that we ignored them. I wrote an article after uh, Comrade Adams was removed from uh, the national chairmanship of APC. I wrote an article about it in which I reminded him that you remember that we were at a hotel together and we discussed this matter. Leave this man alone. And let me tell you, the worst thing that can happen in Africa, they can say, yes, discipline your child. Yes, your child is useless. You slap the child one time, boom, the child faints. People are going to turn around and say, that man is a wicked man. He must be you know, an evil man. He has killed it. They will call you a murderer. They won't say you were trying to discipline your child. So that is the situation we find ourselves in right now. Every one of those who were fighting Obaseki, we told, calm down. Leave the man to God. If you invested your money and time on a man, and it turns out to be an ingrate, even in the Bible, ingratitude is a sin. You understand? Some of them had valid reasons to fight Obaseki. But then, you, you should also have that spirit of forgiveness. That is one thing I took from Nelson Mandela. That a man who was put in prison for 27 years came back and all he was talking about was uh, reconciliation. If Mandela was a Nigerian, he would have killed all his enemies. So, the situation in Edo right now is that absence of love absence of forgiveness it is all about ego at play big egos at play and it is not good for our people do you think that what we've seen happening between these candidates between these high profile politicians in edo state will unveil a new a new nigeria when it comes to politicians do we do you think that we're seeing the the end of shadow governments or, or godfathers. I, I hear what you said when you said that every politician has people behind them and supporting them, powerful people, uh, wealthy people. So it's, it's not so much the godfathers themselves. When we're talking about African, Nigerian politics, legacy is so important. So why are you talking about Obaseki's perceived victory would be a huge damage to Oshiomole's legacy in Edo State for well, Nigeria as a whole, do you think that this, I, this shows... I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I can assure you that if Obaseki wins this tough battle, because it's a battle, uh, it will re-energize re a lot of Nigerians who have given up on Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And that is why everybody is watching at those states. In fact, I have not seen a local election that is almost like a national election, like what is happening in Edo right now. So if Obaseki wins, trust me, it will re-engineer the way people view elections. And it means that a lot of people are going to come together and try to change the way INEC used to misbehave. I saw a video clip yesterday where the votes were being counted. And people were saying one, <laughs> two, three. And you could see it was a festive yes. mood. Yes. And that is what elections should be. Elections should be a carnival, not a war, not a theater of war. So if this happens, then the people will say, oh, it means that if we actually come together to fight our oppressors, we can defeat them. And again, let me not forget the intervention of the governor of River State, Governor Wiki coming to Edo State, definitely energized the people of PDP. He came there confidently 
and he's been saying it. He said, look, I'm not going anywhere until this election is over. And we want to tell them that South-South is not Southwest. You know, those things were very, very powerful statements. People love courageous men. Even when you disagree with them, people love those who can challenge their oppressors. And this is what they have done. Wiki is saying, look, we're not fighting the federal government, but we want the federal government to be serious about Edo, and we want to send the message to them that we will not allow government magic in Edo State. It seems to be working so far so good, but I don't know. Like I said, you know, let's wait till the election is over. I am personally very apprehensive because I have witnessed too many elections in Nigeria. Politicians are ready to rig and then they tell you to go to court. Of course, when you go to court, it is not always very easy. Yeah, so so how, how, I did see that video that you were talking about, and it, 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 it was quite impressive to see how the people were all clamoring together in support of this whole process. Now, when we talk about INEC again, you know, the, you just mentioned rigging. How confident are you that this process will be transparent, you know, given the fact that, you know, it is by law that, you know, INEC would have to also enter some results manually as well. How confident are you that this process will be transparent? This is where election monitoring becomes very important. If the election monitors did a good job yesterday, they would have achieved 60 to 70 percent of what they needed to do by now because they all have copies of elections from every electoral world. And then don't forget there are also external monitors who are not directly involved and who may not carry any bias. So they are more objective in observing what happened and they also have copies don't forget that these days every answer any every phone you have now has a camera it has video so there is no way you will announce something and it will not be captured somewhere on the video it becomes more difficult i neck will be the most irresponsible organization in the world to risk its reputation by changing results after everyone already had copies of it. They will be, and I mean, they've done it before, but at this time and age, if they try it again, then they will be the most recklessly irresponsible agency of government that I know. Mm. When we look at the numbers of registered voters, uh, I, forgive me for wanting to take a few steps back, because when we were in the run-up to yesterday, when polls obviously opened and closed, in terms of voter turnout, it was obviously hard to tell, because all we had to go by was the fact that we had some 2 million people registered to vote, and around 50 to 51 percent of those being men, and obviously very close to that were women uh, registered voters. When we look at the, the turnout, are you able to give us any type of insight into how reflective that is of the sentiment, the current, current political climate? Do you feel as though voter, voter, voter turnout was high and was high because people felt as though they had to have their voices heard, if not for any other election, but definitely this one with so much at stake? Yes, obviously, people uh, were very much interested in this. And uh, the uh, promotion on both sides of the divide, APC and PDP, they promoted their candidates very well. They spent a lot of money. The rallies were very big, very massive. And, you know, uh, the usual thing also that you must note is that when you say you have two, three million registered voters, a lot of times those figures are deliberately inflated because that is the only way uh, some people, they keep some voters' card in hiding and they are able to thumbprint because they already know those extra figures. They know the people who will turn up and they know those who won't. So they keep those things and all they do is thumbprint 
and then they tell you to go and argue it in court, which is a very tedious process. Uh, so in the do yesterday, yes, uh, despite the turnout, I don't think we still had enough based on the number of registered voters, but it was impressive and they conducted themselves well. For me, the most important thing was not the, how many vote, people voted, but the conduct, the peaceful conduct of the election itself. Because yesterday I was in trepidation, I was in prayers. If possible, I would have fasted just for us to have peace. Because I know it's innocent kids who are going to get killed. Politicians don't bring out their own children to mm -hmm. fight for them. You know, when they say, fight for your right, defend your votes, you will not see any of their children there. So I am happy that so far so good they have not started killing innocent kids, and I pray that innocent kids will not get killed this time. All right, well, as we begin to wrap up this uh, uh, segment, uh, what would your, going forward, what would your advice be to Nigerians in other elections in the country, especially in the uh, 2023 uh, general elections? What would your advice be to Nigerians? Uh, well, the first is that we must all remain very vigilant and we must be outspoken. You know, the more we speak out against the recklessness of our political gladiators, the better for all of us. The other is that a lot of young people who say they want to contest election to be president or whatever, in the name of God, I have been through it and I gained a lot of experience. It is almost impossible for a third force to win an election in Nigeria today. Almost impossible, especially at the federal level. What that means is that we must go and proliferate the two leading parties. That is what Donald Trump did in America. He had to I practically hijack the Republican Party because without a solid platform, it is impossible to win these elections. There are too many things that you require. Money, the monitors will collect money from you, and you must have them. Because if you don't have your, your agents in each of the polling booths, your election would disappear. So I'm pleading that we should be much more methodical about how we deal with politics. If you look at nearby Ghana, I have lived in Ghana partly, and I'm following the election in Ghana. Politics in Ghana is like religion. So let's stop wasting our time. I belong to a small party. I love my party, National Conscience Party. But the truth is that I don't see National Conscience Party winning an, a, a national election. Maybe we can do the local ones. But national election, let us get serious. Let us decide whether we want to be in APC or PDP, whatever they are called at that time, and mobilize our people for our candidates. That's the only way forward. But where you have 98 names on a ballot paper, it's, it's too unwieldy. Mm -hmm. And it's a total waste. You know, that's my belief. Two-party system, that's what helped Chifabiola against Bashir Tofa in 1993, because there were only two of them. So we could see who were dealing with. But where you have to deal with every young man wants to contest election, they cannot even agree amongst themselves who should be the one to represent them. It is a waste of time. So the old people we keep complaining about, we come back again and we only have ourselves to blame. Let me ask you this about the methodology behind political theory, especially here in Nigeria. I Again, I, I accept what you've said about a two-party system being what people need to focus on if they want real national level or state level change. However, when you look at other countries, the United Kingdom, for example, where you have the Tories, the Conservatives, and you've got the Labour, and then over in the United States where you've got the Democrats and Republicans, their policies are distinctly different. Even even if they are towards the middle of the spectrum, it's very clear to know what uh, a democratic policy is as opposed to a conservative or a republican one. Here in Nigeria, there doesn't seem to be distinct differences in the politics of the parties themselves. That is why it appears as though we seem to have more uh, focus on your affinity to a politician. Do you think that needs to change? or? 
should it should that status quo remain the same? Well, but for the fact that our politicians are benefiting from the lack of principle, lack of ideology, lack of philosophy, they would have changed that law and they would have made it totally, absolutely illegal for anybody to move from party A to party B and move from party B back to party A. In Ghana, you are not likely to, I haven't seen that before, where you will leave NDC and go to MPP and leave MPP to come to NDC. And from the day you are born, you already have a party. And you know whether this party is democratic or republican. In Nigeria, we don't have any such clear-cut philosophy, principle, or ideology. That's one of the reasons why I initially joined the Labour Party, because I felt that the two top parties were useless to Nigerians. They would never bring any fruits to Nigeria. So I joined the Labour Party, hoping that I could galvanize the workers of Nigeria to follow me. I linked up with the British Labour Party, and I met with a member of parliament who was ready to help us in designing a clear-cut ideology that would be different from the rest of the other parties. I, we sat down to formulate policies in housing, in agriculture, in transport, in education, and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, the Labour Party itself in Nigeria was not ready for such a revolutionary move. So I wasted my time doing all that, came back, and realized that the Labour was as weak as a, as a dog, and we couldn't do much, and that was it. Uh, eventually, I moved to what I termed, I always call Ghani Fire Means Party, because Ghani was a forerunner uh, in that party as a presidential candidate. Ghani couldn't win any, any, any election in Nigeria, despite its popularity. And, and it's because of the way Nigeria is presently configured. And that is why I keep telling my young friends who say they want to contest election that forget about the third party. Even an established politician like Donald Duke, my great friend, I told him, we sat for hours discussing this thing when he said he was going into the third uh, force. I told him it was a waste of time, and that's exactly what happened. Let us concentrate on our energy on making one of the top two parties a progressive party. Right now, nobody can say it is PDP or APC that is progressive. You see, it's the people that make up a political party. It's not the name of the party. So when we have more than enough people in a particular party with similar ideals, you will see that things will begin to change. But right now, every, everything is fluid. You can wake up in APC in the morning and go to bed in the night in PDP. That is very unfortunate. Indeed, well, Delhi Mamadou, thank you very much for your analysis there.